Hey, this is Todd. AJ Chafe, and I apologize, I got your name wrong on Reddit, asked me after I posted the last video on hex mapping and hex crawling, when traveling overland, what do players do and what does the GM do? Which I thought were really good questions and probably lead into the next step, if you will. You've created a hex map, you've prepped out the hex map, the party actually starts to move through it, they move into a hex, what do you do? So let's start with what do you as the GM do when your party enters a new hex? A lot of this is really going to come down to your approach, different systems, different versions of D&D, obviously whole other role playing and systems have their own ways of doing things. And I think over time, you'll begin to develop what works for you, what works for your table, what makes you comfortable. So I'm not giving you the one process that is gonna work for everybody, be perfect, but it's the one that I have used in the past, which I use, and it's probably as good as any base to develop your own system on top of, or at least start out with, and then tweak it and change it as things come up at the table. You have your hex map. So your party enters a forest hex what do you do first thing is which makes sense is you're going to describe where they're entering in this forest hex as i mentioned in other videos when you're looking at a hex that has a tree or the symbol for a forest in it it doesn't mean it's wall-to-wall -wall woods there's going to be a whole lot of different things you want to look at the hexes that are next to it maybe to get an idea of what transitional terrain you might be in so for example if they're coming out of a hill hex and they're entering a forest hex what might that look like it will probably look like some combination of hills and forest probably the hills will start to diminish assuming that this is you know sort of a flatland forest area the hills will probably start to diminish and it'll flatten out and you'll get that forest area but that first part that the players are going to enter is probably a mix of hills and forest. Maybe there are hills that are covered in forest or whatever that transitional area is going to look like for you. So you just need to think about in your mind, what does that area look like? And then as you go deeper to the hex, it's going to be more and more about that dominant type of terrain, which in our case for this example is forest. So it's going to be a lot of forest, but it's not just going to be forest. I like to then look at what kind of unique or not unique, but what obstacles or uh, particular features are there. I guess what I would say is what is unique about this hex of forest versus other hexes of forest or if not unique what is a particular feature here i'll use i mentioned this a lot ready reference guild uh, by judges or ready reference sheets by judges guild they have some great tables i will probably make another video about doing an actual example where i'll run through using the judges guild sheets this one i want to keep to sort of an overview but i will come back to doing an actual example i'll look in that tables that they have and i'll see okay what might there be and you can come up with your own you can just riff off the top of your head if something makes sense to you for example they're coming out of the hills and you know they've been following a stream well that stream continues and that stream and what is you know what is around that stream becomes the feature for that hex it could be something else maybe there's a ravine a, a cut that's in these hills that goes through there maybe it's particularly rocky think about what kind of particular trees or plants or other you know vegetation features might factor into this particular hex fauna what kind of wildlife might be there so you'll want to figure that stuff out using tables as guides if you want to you can obviously take notes in advance if you know that your party's gonna be moving this direction you can you know pre-build a lot of this stuff as much as you want pre-prep it that will help you create descriptions that will give the party things to do because what you want to do with these descriptions is give information to your party so that they can make decisions so for example if they're moving north and they have the stream and the stream makes it sort of an easy trail to follow then and the stream seems to be going that direction they're going to be following that if there's stuff along that stream that's going to be important to them if maybe there are tracks or signs of a particular animal that would obviously be important or obviously if there were kind of intelligent creatures that were using that stream maybe that would be important to them if it's particularly difficult terrain because it's very rocky and rugged and slippery that would be something else maybe they'll decide at this point to move off of the stream so maybe the stream is bending so that it yeah it's going through the hex but it's not going away that they want maybe that would be something else to do all this information is going to give your players the data they need to process and make intelligent choices about what they're going to do you set up basically the overall features which is for example forest you've set up okay here is the feature for this particular hex we're going to say it's a stream that is running out of the hills that they just came from and into the wood then the next thing i like to do is i like to roll for random encounters i do mine's a little bit different than the kind of classic approach i'll do it for each day night cycle in a hex because i want to give the opportunity for there to be things that are active during the day things that are active during the night and it's not necessarily the same and then for each hex it gets the kind of pattern of encounters i like encounters don't have to be combat i don't want to turn this into a, a, a video on encounters but we have to keep in mind when you're running encounters in the wilderness they can often have dangerous creatures or large numbers of creatures depending on how you're running your random encounters but with the distances and everything involved and the fact that you know in, in my case i like to use morale and reactions and a whole lot of other 
other tools. Just because I roll up Goblin doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, rolling initiative. There could be a lot of things to play with with that encounter outside of combat. But I'm going to roll that encounter right away. And the reason why I want to do that is it's a large hex. I don't know exactly where in the hex that these creatures are going to be. But by rolling it up now, it gives me an opportunity to place them in the hex. And then depending on which directions and things the party is going, and I can obviously then simulate maybe what those creatures are doing. I can create some interactions, create things that the party can observe, detect, and then again, make choices about. So for example, let's say I roll some encounters, I get goblins, hex, you know, six sided hex, I'll roll 1d6. If a hex is six equilateral triangles, I will pick which one of those triangles I'll know from the angle that the players came in which triangle they're in and I can see well is it really close to them or is it opposite for them is it on the side wherever it is I can kind of figure out I'm not trying to nail down a ton of specifics I just want to know in sort of a quantum cloud kind of way just about how far I just want to know essentially is it really close is it close is it somewhat far is it really far if the party's over here and the goblins are way on the whole other side of the hex that's probably about three two to three miles that will inform to me what they may hear what they may see all these other things if they're in the same quadrant that will be informative in that way what I want to do is I want to get that and to me the earlier I get that information for myself behind the screen so to speak then I can start working that in the description so there's a stream going through the woods I roll goblins I roll that is maybe one quadrant over and I'm thinking that this stream is gonna I've decided that this stream is gonna pass all the way through this 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 hex of woods the streams gonna go through so just doing some thinking I'm just gonna say okay these goblins are also coming to the stream they're refilling their water canteens there they're kind of gathering up, taking a rest from whatever it is that they're doing, which I don't know yet. But this means that as the party is moving along, they have a chance to scout out the goblins. The goblins also have a chance to scout out the party and I can play with what perception checks might reveal. Um, maybe I'm rolling perception checks with the goblins. What do they reveal? That really plays into what's happening in sex. It makes the hex feel dynamic. Now suddenly it's not just, okay, we're moving through woods and then there are goblins right in front of us attack. It's you hear things. Maybe you smell something. Maybe you see tracks. Everything's going to feel, it's, or hopefully, it will feel in the flow and we'll feel like oh there's just some goblins randomly here no it's gonna feel like there's a goblin party perhaps a whole in in the wilderness i like to use the kind of old school thing where there could be you know 50 60 80 goblins here spread out it's gonna feel that it's integrated into the fiction it's not gonna feel like abruptly i'm just dropping you know final, final fantasy style the, the landscape swirls and suddenly goblins are here i want it to feel totally integrated so i like to roll the random encounters up front that way i can place them in the hex and as the party moves through the hex and get closer or further away that will dictate what I'm saying in the fiction about the description. That's basically what I lay out for mine. This is assuming that there's nothing special in the hex, that the destination's not in the hex, that they're going through. Obviously, if, if they're going through a castle and the castle's in the hex, then I will have some stuff that I've probably pre-prepped about that castle that I'll want to enter into it and probably about the habitat around that castle. But assuming that basically the party's either just exploring it to explore it or just moving through to another destination, those are the things I want. So flora, fauna, the major terrain, any kind of minor sub hex features or just features that are particular to that hex and then random encounters. So boom. So th that for me is I've set everything up and now I, I can throw it back to the players and find out what they want to do. So what should your party be doing when they enter on a hex? Well, they're the obvious things, very similar to what you would do in a dungeon. You want to think about and they can plan this in advance. A lot of groups that I've played with and that I've run, you know, they will actually use a note card. We'll write down sort of your standing marching order, how distant everyone is away from each other, you know, who's in front, who's in the rear, all that stuff. One other thing that's helpful, you don't have to use this, but it's helpful. Uh, Adventures in Middle Earth. I forget what their, this is their 5e conversion. I forget what the other one is called. The One Ring. I think maybe it is. I have that too somewhere, but pull this one out. Has a great setup for journeying and their setup on page 164, I guess, is my, my bookmark is correct. We'll talk about different roles that characters can have on the journey. And they have four. One is a guide. And I'm just going to read directly from the book. Guide in charge of all decisions concerning route, rest, and supplies. Guides rely on, okay, wisdom and survival. Scout in charge of setting up camp, opening new trails. Scouts rely on stealth and investigation. Hunter in charge of finding food in the wild. Hunters rely on success with survival checks. And the lookout in charge of keeping watch. Lookouts rely on their abilities in perception. So it's been a while since I've read through this, but basically I think that they, as a group, you would assign one of these to each player and that would be something that they're responsible for in the journeying part of the adventure. And you don't have to use those precisely, but they're good. It's a good tool. If you think about if you're traveling in a group, 
what kind of roles you might have. Somebody is probably going to be the best at navigating. And I would say navigating is that plotting the trail ahead, looking at if you have a trail, looking at it. If if not, plotting that course, figuring out, okay, we should be going this way, that way. If you have, say, animals in a cart, maybe they're trying to find the best, flattest path for that or for, you know, just the le- the least difficult path that allows you to go where you're going. They're concentrating on, we know we're trying to get northeast, we find that path northeast. That's sort of the navigator's job. Then you have lookout or lookouts. I think in I think in the One Ring and Avengers of Alert, they kind of limit it to one person in the party per job. But I don't think you have to do that. I think you could obviously have multiple lookouts and you can use group rolling or rolling with advantage. However you want to do Everybody could roll and the highest perception goes. Something that you want, in essence, you're going to have people who are looking out. I think this is different than the navigator because the navigator is concentrating on finding those paths so if you think about it you're in the woods and you're trying to make a path the navigator is concentrating on let's say you're following a game trail is looking down looking at the terrain that's right in front of them looking at at those sort of things maybe looking up if i can i see the sun what's happening they're kind of concentrating on that so i think that that person that's kind of their one job but if you have three or four party members and you have the ranger out front that's doing navigating then yeah the other three can be eyes all around maybe if you have a wagon or a horse they're on horseback they're kind of looking have that higher view they're looking around. Maybe you spread out, covering out, looking to make sure that, you know, people are coming from different directions. So you have a couple of lookouts looking, you know, different left or right. Maybe someone's looking behind you. Maybe someone's kind of overwatching over the top ahead. It makes a lot of sense. Another role that could be, depending on your setup, is basically who's handling the animals, driving the cart, making sure the horses or the mules or whatever is doing fine, who's doing the animal husbandry portion of the travel. And they mention a hunter, again, depending on your circumstances. If you have a druid or somebody with good berry, then you know you don't need someone to hunt. If you don't have anybody and, and you're running low on supplies, a pretty important part of hex crawling because tensions of the hex crawl or the our resources and time versus finding out or figuring out how to get to and getting to where you need to go. So you're trying to get from point A to point B. You have limited resources. You have potentially limited time. And even if your time isn't limited, time starts to ratchet in more consequences because time is going to help you eat up resources. The more time you spend, the more chances are you might get lost, the more chances of random encounters showing up. So time is that really that pusher that's or that, that mover that's going to move all these other consequences, keep ticking them up. So you have time which triggers your resources. And then, you know, you're trying to get where you're going. So it's a tension of, of, of that. You're trying to get to a location, destination, and you're trying to, you're working against time, which is eating up your resources to get there. So if you don't have somebody who is supplying you with food on a daily basis and water, then having a hunter type who may be as you're moving, just going, you know, a little bit off to the side, maybe trying to get small game, trying to find sources of water, berries, all that stuff could be another important role. So you don't have to have all those roles. You can explain to them these roles exist and ask them who they want to take. So some can say, oh, I'm I'm great at that. So I'll do that. Oh, and I'll do that. And, you know, and if anybody else who doesn't really have anything specific, they can be lookouts. So those are their, in a sense, fictional, but also mechanical duties. As far as navigation, if you're trying to avoid getting lost, then whoever's following the trail or creating the trail, that's going to be their shtick. And they're going to be, you know, rolling any skill checks for that or making fictional positioning to avoid having to make skill checks for that. Same thing with the lookouts. How are they positioning themselves to do the best looking out that they can do? And then if they either using passive perception or active perception or both to determine if they see anything. So they're setting up and hopefully what you've described to them is informing all their decisions and potentially giving them interesting questions to answer. So they're moving along the stream and you have decided that the goblins are close enough that you're starting to hear them and you're not sure they're not sure what they are yet. It's sort of indistinct, but you can kind of hear them. It's echoing around a little bit we're still in a little bit of hills sounds echoing around but they can hear it now what do the players do do they do they keep the party moving on their path do they then change their mind and go off path do they stop do they send people out to scout right so you're creating interesting decisions for them to make while moving through the hex and ideally i think in each hex you move through there are interesting choices to make. But as a GM, you can't worry necessarily about that. And I, I guess I would say here that one of the issues I've seen that's come up with some GMs and hex crawling is they feel the need to essentially mandate an activity in every hex. I, I forget where I was. It might have been on a Discord server. Somebody said, oh, I, I really don't like hex crawls. I felt that every hex I had to make an encounter and it just became this chain of encounter to encounter to encounter. And they were talking about combat. You can't do that. 
because it is gonna it's gonna it's gonna drag everything down because you have to understand that if you come into your game session and you say we're gonna spend all night hex crawling that might work out fine you might you might start out hex crawling and because of things that are happening in individual hexes you might have enough to do with it. yeah it lasts hours between the party trying to consider different decisions interesting things come in maybe there's a, a little ruined tower over there and now they want to go check that out and maybe there was a a, a crypt that they found that was buried, you know, under some vegetation deep in the woods. And now they want to check that out. But it could also could be that they just decide, you know what, we're not touching it. Keep moving. And so you end up with, OK, you're spending game time and nights are passing, days are passing. But that can go very fast in the fiction if the party just decides, you know what, we need to get to that fort that's two days away and we're just beelining it. It's at that point that if you try to force it to slow down, that it's going to start to feel like a chore. So don't what you what I recommend is the, the great thing about playing the hex crawl portion of the game is you can play it so loose with improv and with kind of random tables informing your prep that if you know that they're trying to get from wherever they are now to a fort that's two days away, don't prep the hex crawl part so much beyond setting up the stuff that you need in general for hex maps. You know, you have your this geographic area there and you've set up your random encounter tables. You've got whatever system you're going to use to generate smaller features and flora, fauna, all that stuff. Once that stuff is done, don't think about, oh, I have to try to entertain them every hex. And don't think about how long it's going to take. Think about, okay, so now for tonight, let me make sure I have stuff on that fort because they may get there, they may not. I don't know, but you can't count on it. That's a mistake where a GM says, I'm going to fill out my whole night with a hex crawl and the party just doesn't want to do it or they just roll well you know you could roll and forest and there's nothing there besides you know forest right i take this idea with a stream and they're following it and i'm rolling some dice and all there are is some let's say some deer maybe some interesting trees but they decide not to do that or there is something interesting but they're keeping their eye on the prize so to speak and they don't want to mess with it and they just hurry their pace and they bust on through ideally for me it's like that's that's fine what i what is the mistake is if you think oh my gosh no i have two hours left a game tonight i need to stop them i need to force them to interact with this thing put that out of your mind don't try to force anything with a hex scroll let it come as it comes make sure that if anything you've prepared the destination because you can't say for certain how much actual real time is going to take to get there because game days can either be really slow or they can go by really fast can't count on it don't worry about it so getting back to what players are going to do so they have these tasks they can do, right? So you have lookout, you've got a navigation, potentially hunter hunting or gathering, potentially uh, animal handling, doing the animal husbandry. And again, hopefully they're interacting with the fictional description that you've given them to move through the hex. And then essentially that's it. And then you'll decide based on what kind of hex it is, whatever movement they're using, are they on horseback, are they on foot, whatever it is, how long it takes them before they get to the edges of the next hex. You can roll to see if they're lost and then you can roll to see if they do get lost, you know, how their course is altered. Come to the borders of the next hex, start the process over again, and you just repeat as much as you need and that might sound that everything's gonna be boring if there's nothing there if it really is that you get into it oh, it's woods and it's mostly pines and maybe there's some spruce I guess which is another pine but whatever there's some maple mixed in and a couple interesting things and the party just beelines it through then that's it I make you take five minutes to say okay now it's lunchtime six hours have passed you're going into the next thing right that's it and that's totally acceptable I, th I think it's a much better situation if you just pass time quickly because there's nothing there than to add more roles in or sort of draw it out you know or, or try to make it more than it is where you where you start trying to na na narrate little minor moves in the movement that don't really mean anything oh you come to a tree what do you do and the players just go I don't know we go around the tree and keep going okay but now you come to a brook what do you do uh we go over the brook like don't don't just artificially just you know put little obstacles in front of you to put them in there if, if they can basically move through those woods six miles or whatever it is and get to the next thing and there's no nothing there that's really meaningful as far as their decisions or as far as impacting their travel then you know do i usually will have pauses at lunch and obviously pauses at so basically the adventure that i look at it is i look at it as about 12 hours so you can march at pace without bringing on exhaustion but that includes a couple smaller breaks which i'll usually just narrate and not get into again and unless there's a random encounter that I rolled up and I think it's going to impact them around their break time. But basically, I'll, you know, they'll take a, an hour break or so somewhere in between. And then I usually will then stop them for lunch. So basically six, six hours, five hours of travel, one intermediate break, then lunch break. If they don't stop for lunch, they want to keep moving. I'll probably look at maybe making rolls for exhaustion or something else to 
basically, I want to make sure they indicate that it's not a uh, not a little walk in the park. Potentially, you're encumbered. You're doing things carefully. This is the wilderness. It's a wild place. It is going to take its toll. You have to kind of take it seriously. If they decide not to stop for lunch, I will have that impact them. But essentially, usually, I really haven't had that happen unless they're in a super rush or something's chasing them, which obviously changes a lot of effort. Lunchtime gives them a chance to reflect on anything that they've seen, potentially rethink any decisions that they want to take more sightings or figure out or determine more or less if they've been on the right course. That's fine. You know, they can do all that stuff. They can eat their rations, tick off a ration for the day, whatever. So I'll do that lunch break. And then once night falls or it's dusk and it's time to basically stop, stop moving and figure out where they want to camp for the night and do that situation. And that's that stop in between those two. I will, you know, I'll navigate them or I will narrate them moving along. But my focus is on getting them to meaningful decisions. So if it's six miles of going into the woods and I know that there's nothing happening and there's nothing around them, then I'm just going to that's just going to be one 30 seconds worth of me saying it's a beautiful day in the woods. The, the, the sunlight is trickling, making you lovely beams through the through the trees and, and onto the forest floor. Your your boots crunch over the dried leaves and and the and, and some branches that are on the ground. And there's maybe there's a, a some kind of a fungus that, that is on the trees or on the floor. Maybe that has a nice smell to it. And there are the bees and, you know, whatever other uh, butterflies and there are birds flying overhead and whatever else. And OK, I'm going to go through a 30 second spiel or a minute spiel. And then I'm going to say, OK, it's been a few hours. You've done that. Maybe the terrain is maybe I'm looking at the next hex. That, so in front of them. So, for example, let's say I'm moving from forest to hills. Again, I'll, we'll talk about that. Maybe the terrain's changing. There's more undulations to the ground. Maybe it's a little bit rockier. Maybe just there are some minor hills and I'm seeing that the trees are thinning up ahead or that you, know, you can tell the elevation is changing. The wind is changing. All those things that will impact how I describe it going forward. But I'm going to go through that and I'm going to say, OK, it's lunch. You guys unpack, do whatever you do for lunch and, you know, give them a chance to then give me more directions on what they're doing. Obviously, if there's stuff they want to do along the way, you know, they're free to stop and say, OK, oh, there's some fungus. Let me get a sample. All that stuff. Great. But basically assuming that they're not interested in that, then I'm going to just go to lunch. And if there's nothing going on and there's eating their rations and hitting the road again, then that's again, it's going to be fast going to the next one. So you can see how you can really churn through hexes if nothing's going on. And that's fine. What you want to do is just make sure that they have all the information to make kind of decisions they want. And I did forget one thing when I'm prepping the hexes, weather, sometimes weather is going to be a big deal. Sometimes not. I think it adds again, that dynamic nature of they're entering a woods. What's happening in the woods? Maybe it's early morning and it's misty and it's overcast and it might rain. How does that impact everything? Sunny or it's hot, humid, whatever it is. So definitely come up with weather. There are lots of random generators uh, that you can use, or you can just look at where the weather is, wherever you are and use that to inform the weather for the day. But where it is, it's a nice thing to work in the weather system and how that might impact everything, particularly when you bring factor in random encounters because that might change things a lot. If it's let's say it's a heavy storm, that's obviously going to impact your everybody's visibility, ability to hear things over the sounds of the weather. Maybe I think like, OK, if they're a half mile from the goblins, they'll start to hear things because the goblins are loud and they don't care. But now it's raining, it's storming, lots of thunder and lightning. One, the goblins are probably not making a ton of noise. And now even if they were a lot harder to hear it, a lot harder for them to see each other. And maybe they could pass really close and never be in contact just because visibility is so bad because of the weather. So don't forget weather is a factor there. That's it. That's your hex crawl in a nutshell. When you're entering a new hex, weather, determine your encounters, if there are any, where they are, determine, look at the major features, look at the minor features, lump that all together into your description. Players should be picking roles for themselves or you can, you shouldn't necessarily determine the roles for them, but you can tell them what roles are available and what needs doing for them to be effective. And then they can choose who's doing it. You can use for inspiration, adventures in Middle Earth, or something else if you have something. And what they're going to be doing is a guide who guide, or I call the navigator, who's navigating their way forward, who's looking out, there's anyone hunting or gathering for supplies, who's doing that. If someone's taking care of the animals, who's doing that. And then you're just going to really play. It's going to be this action reaction as you're going along. I like to do a 12 hour marching day, all things considered, which will with a break in the middle for lunch. And like I said, usually two hour breaks for rest. You can decide what pace of travel makes the most sense to you. And, it, and obviously with all these things are the consequences because really in the hex crawl, it's all about these actions, reactions, which are generating consequences that then generate more decisions. So you're in a hurry. You don't want to spend 12 hours. You want to try to do it in six hours. Well, then what is the consequence of that in terms of are you exhausting yourself? Are you bringing on levels of exhaustion? Are you not as careful as you could be with not being detected or, you know, making the right choices in navigation, all these different factors? Does that put you at disadvantage for some of those checks? Does it do certain things see you because you're moving quickly instead of carefully? You know, all these things. So what you're trying to 
do is really you're, you're setting up this whole environment to create these interesting decision spaces for your party that you can play off of as they're moving across the wilderness. Once you get all that down, that's it. There's not a whole lot of, of magic in there. Really, the magic is going to be, obviously, as a GM, can I paint a picture well enough to give you in your mind, in your imagination, you know, the party moving, your characters moving through this environment? Can I make that space seem interactive enough to you to at least tempt you with different decisions and interesting decisions, right? It's, it's not about me putting little obstacles in front of you. And then hopefully the time you guys are spending as players or as the players are spending, then considering making choices and rolling with those. Once you have that space set up, it's just a matter of moving through the space. Once you've got all your tools in place, I think you'll find that it won't be difficult to take an overland travel segment and turn it into something that can be both interesting and worth exploring both as a GM and as a player. I, th I think that often with a lot of times you see people just kind of roll their eyes with the overland travel portion of an adventure because they just want to get to where they're going. But there could be a lot of interesting things that happen along the way. Sometimes the most interesting things in the adventure might happen along the way. And what you're doing is you're creating a space for that. Hopefully with the tools, the hex maps, the tables, the random encounters, the weather, the roles, you're giving everybody access into this space to make it something fun and interesting for them that feels integral that feels makes them feel like they're in the world so i think that's the biggest thing is it's easy just to jump travel and say oh, okay five days later you're over here but you don't necessarily get that sense of distance and space that you get when you if you if you just teleport there or you just wave your hands and they're there there's something to be said for if it's going to take you a week to get from one coast to the other coast what is that like what is the terrain like what is the landscape like? what's happening in this place all that space to me it, it really adds to the depth of the world and makes the world feel more real and more dynamic and gives you more of a sense that you're in it as opposed to that you're hopping from scene to scene. So I really enjoy hex crawling and the overland travel. I definitely dig it as a GM. I've always been interested in it as a player when it's when it's done in a way that allows you to engage with it, but it doesn't feel forced. And so that's the whole thing with the hex maps is don't make it feel forced. Create the environment and allow the party the space to engage with it in different ways. And that's it. Hopefully this will help with the hopefully I answered the question. AJ Chafe, let me know if I didn't. Or what do you do as players when you enter a hex? What do you do as a GM when you enter the hex? Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you later.